Welcome everyone to the Engineers Chief Scientist Manitoba Lunch and Learn on Digital Signatures. Before we start the session today, I'd like to acknowledge that the Association Office and the majority of its practitioners are located on Treaty 1 territory and the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, Inuit, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. Many generations have arrived to our province and contributed to its development, but we must not forget that this land, Indigenous land, has been inhabited by Indigenous peoples from the beginning. Those first people called this area home for generations and thrived, took care of the land, and developed unique ways and methods of design to survive in our pro province's harshest of conditions, the province's original engineers and geoscientists. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories, we acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. I'll now pass it over to Charles Tremblay to deliver the main part of the presentation. Thank you very much, Mike, uh, for uh, this introduction and important message. Um, so yeah, welcome everyone. Uh, glad you made it on this, uh, that you're taking your lunch time with us. Uh, today's session, Introduction to Digital Seals, Electronic Document Authentication for Engineers, Geoscientists, Manitoba. Um, in today's session, a couple of housekeeping stuff. <coughs> Sorry, this session is being recorded. Uh, so the recording will be made uh, available to those who weren't able to attend live. Uh, your host, myself, I'm the uh, business development manager at Natarius. I work with 54 different professional associations that Natarius works with across Canada. I am also accompanied today by Monsieur Mike. Grégoire, Michael Grégoire, uh, Director of Professional Standards at uh, Engineers uh, Geoscientists uh, Manitoba. So he'll keep me honest throughout the course of this presentation. Um, I'll try to do a couple of pause during the presentation to keep as interactive as possible. Uh, please, if you have any questions during the session, and at the end, we'll also have a, a Q&A session, please submit your questions through the chat feature and we'll try to answer as many as we can. So on the agenda today, who is Natarius? <clears throat> um, also speak of the current context, uh, work uh, changes that have been happening uh, over the last couple of years, uh, legal requirements in document reliability uh, ingredients um, as per the applicable laws in Manitoba, different types of electronic signatures. So we'll learn that there's varying levels of reliability. There's a lot of solutions available on the market they bring a varying level of reliability um, and, and engineers geoscientists um, uh, has put together some requirements and this is why we are working in partnership with uh, the association. Why uh, do regulators across Canada come up with requirements for electronic document authentication? We'll learn that too and we'll also have a, a free and easy validation for the public so it's one thing that you have an e-authentication tool uh, it's another thing that the public has access to free means to validate uh, the data integrity and your signature. And we'll have a quick demo at the end as well, just a quick introduction of how the uh, software works and for the relying parties, what to look for to make sure that your document has been authenticated. So first off, <clears throat> who is Natarius? We uh, are celebrating our 25th year of our 25th anniversary, <laughs> we've been providing trusted signatures to professional, to governments, to organizations or companies and systems as well. So we now integrate in different um, um, e-signature platform that relies on us as well uh, to, uh, to, to um, provide e-signature um, features to their uh, systems. We enable the production and issuance a reliable electronic document that can be read, we'll speak of that, and authenticated over decades. Uh, it is one of the engineer's reality is that the work that you're uh, doing, uh, often the infrastructure work that you're doing, they have a long life cycle, um, 25, 50, 100 years. <clears throat> so we need to make sure that we'll be able to read and authenticate those uh, electronic draw uh, drawings and documents for decades. <clears throat> Couple of uh, certifications. This is not a technical presentation, but if you want to do a bit of uh, digging, 
Uh, from a management perspective, we are certified ISO 9001. We were the first certificate authority in North America to be certified ISO 27001. So if you wanna Google that, that's an information security standard. We'll learn a bit more what a certificate authority is. Uh, this is our, our core business. We are also the only uh, certificate authority in Canada to be on the approved trust list, the Adobe approved trust list, which is kind of a gold standard if you're looking to, uh, to, to work with a trusted certificate authority. We also meet uh, IEDAS compliance. This is for the European marketplace, but that's another gold stamp that you like to look for with regards to electronic signature. Uh, there's strong legal framework in Europe and requirements that you need to meet over there. We're recognized by multiple government entities. Uh, <clears throat> we are um, preferred in Alberta, in New Brunswick. We work with federal government and um, a lot of uh, provincial entities and local government will rely on our digital signature solutions as well. Um, we are a strong advocate of the PDF-A. It's an ISO archive standard. We were speaking of longevity We've all had the experience in the past where as we migrate from uh, one software version to another, the previous documents, the font changes, the content changes, sometimes funny uh, um, fonts or, or, or letters or numbers are replaced by letters or numbers because of the new version. Uh, there is an archive standard for PDF file format, which is an open source file format. There's hundreds of PDF editors on the market that are available and there's an ISO standard to make sure that whatever you're creating today, you'll be able to open and read in 20, 30 years from now with Adobe Reader version 20, for example. Um, we're also a member of the uh, Digital ID and Authentication Council of Canada Cloud Signature Consortium. Again, these are round tables where best practices are, are put together and applied and we like to be uh, make sure that we're applying the best, latest and greatest uh, best practices. As I mentioned, we work with 54 different regulators across the country. Um, we work with a couple of uh, them in, in Alberta, uh, Manitoba Landscape Architects, uh, Manitoba Architects Association, obviously engineers, geoscientists. Uh, we work with 16 different professions, lawyers, notaries, engineers, architects, land surveyors, um, so a lot of different uh, geoscientists as well. In some provinces, the geoscientists are separate from the engineers, so we work with them as well. So um, this brings us to the changing business landscape. What has changed over the past couple of years? Obviously, even before COVID came around, cloud adoption was already growing rapidly. Uh, why? Well, it allows us to work from anywhere at any time on any device and from either a small business perspective or even larger business perspective, it allows our, our IT um, staff to be much more nimble and, and be able to go out and, and consume uh, software as a service. <clears throat> so really we're moving into a software-based economy or what I like to call an application-based economy. We're engaging with customers, suppliers, partners, um, through application, through our smartphones, tablets, PCs. And uh, a lot of time, these devices are also the devices that we use for work, but also for play. And they end up being, uh, our smartphone has basically ended up out competing the toothbrush as the first thing we pick up in the morning to check on our messages and the last thing we, we deposit in the evening as well. Um, obviously, COVID-19 has drastically accelerated this transformation with the work from home, and this had some tremendous impact for engineers, you scientists, no longer having access to office supplies, printers, plotters. Uh, that meant that, but, but you still had the requirements to authenticate your documents. So how do we do that remotely, um, uh, moving away from the traditional rubber stamp? Uh, so definitely COVID-19, and we've seen it on our part, we basically doubled the amount of subscriptions uh, annually over since the beginning of the pandemic because people had to work remotely. Um, so let's look at that, the, um, the, the key ingredients for document reliability. So when we're talking about being able to remotely authenticate documents, um, electronic documents, and no longer the good old rubber stamp. So, Obviously, when you look at the late 1990s, the internet came of age, 
Uh, and now we're moving into more of a cloud and application-based economy. So over the last 30 years, information technology has uh, fostered uh, the development of e-commerce. The first significant ones to adopt it were banks. So to be able to do uh, online banking. And now we all have our banking application on our, on our iPhones and, and Androids. So this has led to significant changes in business practices and process uh, and have allowed document to evolve from a paper to a digital form. And in order to overcome the various legal obstacles uh, and, and facilitate this transformation, well, um, laws have been put together that recognize the legal validity of electronic transactions and documents. And in Canada, like in many countries around the world, basically what we did is we endorsed the Uniform Electronic Commerce Act, which was developed in 1996 by the United Nations. So let's take a look at these different legal frameworks and try to find the key ingredients for document reliability. Let's start at the international level. What does that Uniform Electronic Commerce Act say about uh, requirements for a signature? So where the law requires a signature, and in the case, it would be the Engineers Geoscientists Act of Manitoba, you are required to authenticate your document. If an electronic signature is used, it has to be as reliable as appropriate for the purpose for which the data message was generated or communicated. What does that mean, as reliable? It means that, uh, for example, if you're visiting a web page, a website, the web, uh, uh, the, the, the site owner will let you know that you're using cookies uh, to gather data about you, uh, geolocation, language, stuff like that. And when you click, I accept, you're making a form of electronic consent. It is a form of electronic signature. Uh, there's not a whole lot of implications uh, in accepting or refusing cookies. Um, the same go if I uh, accept to meet Mike Gregoire for lunch tomorrow, and uh, we're doing this by email. I'm accepting that we will meet tomorrow for business lunch. Uh, I am making a form of electronic consent. But the legal implication of me not showing up for lunch, other than Mike, will probably not be happy at, at me for not showing up, or probably not high. So the level of reliability for those use cases doesn't have to be that high. But if you're putting a, your stamp and your name onto a multi million dollar project, that has a whole, and, and it has public safety involved as well. Uh, structures uh, that needs uh, to resist to a certain amount of snowfall, for example, uh, to avoid collapsing on, on, on people under. Uh, well, that's a whole different story. So the level of reliability in those use cases would have to be much higher. And an electronic signature is considered to be reliable for the purpose of uh, satisfying the requirements in the first paragraph, Number one, A, uh, it's linked to the signer and no other person. That the signature is also under the control of the signer and no other person. And that any alteration to the electronic signature made it after the time of signing is detectable. Uh, so we'll go back to that in a couple of slides. We'll find out the key ingredients, but we're starting to get our answers right away. In Canada, again, as I mentioned, we, um, we endorse the um, Uniform uh, Electronic Commerce Act of the United Nations. Uh, all the provinces uh, adopted their own. Uh, I mentioned BC here, but we'll take a look at the Manitoba one in a couple of slides. Uh, they all, every provincial legislation, as well as the federal one, they all recognize the legal value of the electronic document. So there are two key principles here. One is functional equivalence. Uh, documentary media are interchangeable, so you, you can go from paper to electronic uh, or, or, uh, or magnetic media, for example. Uh, so there's a functional equivalence and there's technical technological neutrality. So there's there's no more there's not a support of information that has more or less legal value. So paper doesn't have more or less legal value than an electronic document. So we took a look at the international level. Let's take a look at the federal level here. Uh, there's provisions of the Canadian Evidence Act that is interesting read, but there's also the Personal uh, Information Privacy of Electronic Documents Act, which applies to federal institutions. Unless you're working at a federal institution, this should not necessarily apply to you, but 
Uh, let's take a look at the definition they make for electronic signatures. Um, number one, um, the process or the technology used is unique to the person. Number two, the use is under the control of the sole control of the person. Number three, the technology or process can be used to identify the person. And number, and the last one is to determine whether the electronic document has been changed since the electronic signature was applied. So we're starting to see a trend between what the United Nations uh, Electronic and Uniform Electronic Commerce Act, the federal one uh, defines as well, lots of similarities. So let's take a look at the Manitoba, the Electronic Commerce and Information Act of Manitoba. Number one, right off the bat, an electronic signature means electronic information that a person has created or adopted in order to sign a document. So it's any electronic means that you have adopted. But with requirements for signature, again, we're seeing at 13.1 A1 or I, uh, it has to be reliable for the purpose of identifying the person. So let's go back to one example I gave. If I'm visiting a web page and I'm accepting cookies, but I'm using the family computer. So we're five living in my household, me, my wife, and three uh, children, actually young adults or, uh, or So who of us went to that web page? So uh, the click I accept uh, is not really a good way of identifying someone. With regards to original, um, where there's a requirement to provide or retain original, which is which are requirements for, for engineers and geoscientists, uh, there needs to be reliable, again, reliable assurances uh, that the electronic document contains the information in the original document and that the information has remained complete and un unaltered. So, I think we're trying to see what are the key ingredients, but let's go on. Requirement to retain information. Again, uh, providing is making sure that the, the, the information that I provide is, is tamper-proof. With regards to retaining or for my archive, again, I need to make sure that the documents will uh, remain protected uh, and unaltered during the course of their life cycle. <clears throat> so, we can start to see the similarities between United Nations, Federal, and Manitoba. Uh, namely, that we're, we're looking at two key ingredients. How reliable is it that I know who the person agreeing or signing is? And how reliable it is that the information has remained complete and unaltered? So the key ingredients um, for uh, electronic document authentication really is know who's signing, reliably know who's signing, and have reliable uh, assurances as for the data integrity. So one plus the other, we've got uh, a high level authenticity of electronic records. We add to that recipe our own key, one of our key ingredients as well as longevity especially for engineers uh, working on, on, on infrastructure project. Um, the question is, how will I be open, able to open those files that I've created today in a software version in 2022 in some other software version in 2035? Uh, so how reliable is uh, the data longevity? This is why we're a strong advocate of the PDF A file format. It is uh, a file format, an ISO standard that will make sure that your documents will be able to be open and read without being altered or modified in the future. Also, official records require a high degree of reliability, even if the technology used to sign it or its provider, in this case, Materius, should no longer exist. So the proof has to be embedded in the record itself and not a link to a service provider that who knows what the future holds for that service provider, even if the audit log cannot be found as well. Uh, a lot of times what you'll have is electronic signature system. They have logs in their own environment. But again, if the provider no longer exists, chances are the logs have disappeared. We no longer have the proof of authenticity. So the proof has to live on its own, needs to be embedded ideally in the document. So. That brings us to a quick introduction into e-signatures. 
Um, I'll just make a quick pause to see if I have any questions in the chat. Actually, um, Mike, if you want the, do, do you see any questions in the uh, chat? I'm not seeing anything right now. Not at this time, Charles, no. Perfect, excellent. So let's move along then. Um, what are the different types of electronic signature? Well, actually, what, what is an electronic signature and then what types exist? Again, from a legal standpoint, a signature is a permanent mark bonded to static documents that is traceable, exclusive, and personal to an individual. These are criteria that we took for granted with a handwritten signature. Handwritten signatures are unique to a person, extremely difficult, if not impossible, to imitate someone's signature. And that can be expertise. So the weight that you put on your pencil, the speed that you do your different curves in your signature, the way that you're gonna write uh, letters and, and, and numbers is unique to you. And it's extremely hard to imitate. So we're trying to kind of replicate that to an electronic world. An electronic signature. So a signature is basically something that I'm using to mark consent or disagreement, but usually it's, it's to mark I agree. An electronic signature is any form of consent that is made electronic. So again, if I'm going on, uh, if I'm downloading a free game on my iPhone, there's always some terms and conditions, licenses, we all read them, right? Um, and we always click I accept. So those are legally enforceable. Um, so despite I might, it might have been one of my children that had access to my, my iPhone and downloaded the game. Uh, a digital signature. So I like to speak of electronic signature as all breeds of dogs, right? A digital signature is a German Shepherd. It's a specific breed of signature. And it's based on a public key infrastructure, an electronic signature, which reliability characteristics have been reinforced with what we call asymmetric key encryption. I want to go into a deep dive today explaining how asymmetric key encryption works, but asymmetric key encryption is extremely reliable for the purpose of protecting data integrity. Now, the way you issue and you manage a digital signature to someone that is what we do. So asymmetric key encryption is the technology. It's very reliable for the purpose of protecting data integrity. The way you manage those credentials is the way to make sure that you know the signer's identity. So there's two key pieces here. Number one, there's a certificate authority. A certificate authority is an organization that operates one or several public key infrastructure. So when the does, operate a couple of public key infrastructures for different use cases. And we're basically responsible to manage the life cycles of digital signature certificates that we issue to individuals. There's no way that you can get an individual digital signature certificate from the terrorists without us doing a face-to-face -face via video conferencing where you'll need to show at least two valid pieces of ID. We need to make sure that we know who you are. So there's a verification of the identity of the person. Then there's the registration authority, which is Engineers Geoscientists Manitoba. So once we are satisfied that, for example, Mike Grégoire is who he claims to be because we did the online verification of this a piece of, of this valid piece of ID, then we want to make sure that that person is registered at Engineers Geoscientists Manitoba. This is uh, the role of the registrars of the association. We will pass the request on to the association. They act as a registration authority and they are responsible for receiving and validating the request and also to revoke someone's signature if that person is no longer a member in good standing of the association. Therefore, no longer has a legal right to practice in Manitoba. Well, the association has full authority to revoke. So think of us as the terrorists, you can think of us as the Visa or the MasterCards of this world. We are a trust network. And you might think of your professional association as being your bank. So I can have a Visa card that's issued by CIBC, or I could be a customer of Royal Bank and I could have a Visa card from Royal Bank. In this case, you are getting a digital signature certificate as engineer geoscientist Manitoba. 
So varying levels of reliability for different forms of electronic signature. At the left-hand side, the most unreliable one, we're all guilty of doing it, even I. We've all copied and pasted the image of our signature and or seal or initials onto a document. The problem with that is, is anything that shows up on screen, and we'll have some examples later on, can be copied and pasted onto something else. Control, print screen, Microsoft Paint, copy, paste. I can apply your digital signature, the image of your seal and signature onto anything that you've never seen. Um, it does little if nothing to protect data integrity of the document on which you applied uh, the images as well. Even if you put it read only, typically speaking, again, I can copy the whole information, create a new document and um, tamper with it. Next level up, email signatures. Um, I, that wouldn't apply to a Gmail or Hotmail because obviously they don't do any vetting really. Uh, I could be bozo the clown at gmail.com. Nobody knows who I am. But if you happen to have a notarius.com uh, email address, it's probably because our IT staff made sure that you're on the payroll and it, you should have access to a, a, an email license. So emails, typically the data, uh, data integrity is weak, but you know if it's a corporate email address, um, might be reliable in some cases as to say, yeah, yeah, um, it, you had an agreement that you've agreed to by email. We've got all the traces here. There's metadata, date, time, server licenses, IP addresses. So we could we could sort it out that, that there's a good reason that it might be. In some cases, though, we've, we've seen cases where the judge rejected email proof, uh, saying it's not strong enough. So again, goes back to the level of reliability depending on the context. Um, Self-issued digital certificate. They rely on digital signatures or they rely on asymmetric encryption, extremely reliable for the purpose of protecting data integrity. The problem with those here, nobody's there to check on who I am. So I could be, I have Gemma Keach email address, so I could self-issue uh, or self-forge myself a digital signature certificate with all her credentials and be digitally signing documents on her behalf without her knowing because I self-issued myself a digital credential here. Then next notch up, uh, e-signature platform. You probably know those brand names, DocuSign, HelloSign, eSign Live. We've got our own Consigno Cloud. These are considered advanced electronic signature. They typically do a very good job at protecting data integrity of the documents, especially as long as the documents are in the platform. The moment they leave the platform in PDF file format, sometimes it's, it's, a, it's another game. People can tamper with it. So the truth relies in the platform. That's a limitation. So if HelloSign, DocuSign, eSign Live, or even Consigner Cloud no longer exists in a couple of years, you'll have some, some issues to try and preserve those archives. Um, and it depends how you manage those platforms. So are they using multi-factor authentication such as an email address and an SMS code, for example, a secret service, a shared secret or something else, rather than relying on, hey, you can create a free account with us as being bozo the clown at gmail.com. Again, the idea of the signer at that point, not very reliable. And at the far right corner is the highest standards. Uh, it's a trusted digital signature certificate uh, that would be issued by a trusted certificate authority that made sure to vet your ID and working in conjunction with your professional association, making sure that at the time of signing, you were registered at the association. So in the e-signature spectrum, again, uh, from left to right, the image doesn't tell me who you are, does not protect data integrity, therefore the level of reliability from a legal standpoint weak to an existing. E-signatures, they are typically pretty good at protecting data integrity. However, the way the platform is managed, uh, the level of identity of the signer might be more or less uh, strong, therefore the level of reliability might be more or less. Self-issued digital certificate, very reliable for protecting data integrity. There's no ID check, therefore, the level of reliability can be questioned. Uh, trusted digital signature certificate, they meet the highest standards from the legal standpoint of providing, retaining, and digitally signing original records. 
So um, I'm gonna say I'm seeing right now, there's no question in the chat for now. So uh, let's take a look at engineers, geoscientists, Manitoba, and this is where um, uh, Mike, if, if you wanna step in at any point in time, please do so to keep me honest. These are the requirements for electronic documents authentication. Um, so the engineers and geoscientists, uh, geoscientific professionals act, um, with regards to the digital signature, again, you'll see the resemblance between their definition, the legal definition. It's not a coincidence. Uh, it really a digital signature means form of identification issued by the association to a member or a specified scope of practice licensee to be used to digitally authenticate documents. So if you go to our website and you sign an engineer practicing in Manitoba, you'll be able to choose uh, if you're a PN or geoscientist or um, the appropriate licenses that uh, license and, and practice areas that you're allowed to do. The manual seal means the form of identification uh, issued by the association to the member. So you have a choice. Uh, you can stick with a rubber stamp uh, if it's good for you uh, and, and it fits well with, with the way you're practicing or you can go a digital uh, with a digital a signature. Um, next, what is a di digital signature? It's an electronic document can be authenticated through the application of a digital signature. Again, not copying and pasting images. A digital signature is a security tag that identifies the author because we've checked on your ID and locks down the document protecting the data integrity. When you apply your digital signature to a document, it prevents you or anyone else from making any authorized undetected change to the document. Uh, we'll take a look in a couple of examples later on. You are allowed to do changes to a digitally signed document, but the beauty, especially with the PDF file format, you'll be able to know exactly what has changed on the document. And you'll, uh, by doing a right click on the signature, you can view the signed version as it was when you authenticated it. Um, Authority to use a digital signature shall not be delegated to anyone, nor shall the personal security codes. Uh, again, uh, this points out to uh, think of your digital signature certificate as your bank card. It is something you own on my computer. It is an encrypted file with my digital identity. I need a password to use it. That's the second factor of authentication. It's like your PIN number to your bank card. So it's something that you own, something that you know, and you should never, never share your PIN number to anyone. And you should never, ever share your uh, digital signature password to anyone as well. Uh, still in, uh, this is, uh, I had the hyperlink of the uh, requirements as well in reference. Um, although the security of a digitally signed and sealed document is verified through the digital signature certificate, any electronic versions of uh, the, the uh, professional's manual seal and signature can be applied in conjunction with the uh, signature. So basically, uh, we'll see it a bit later on. Uh, we're able to apply the image of a signature and seal onto an electronic document and digitally sealing the whole file, including the image that were um, uh, applied to the record. Um, and again, members in specified code of practice, uh, licensees may only use their digital signature issued by an approved supplier under the authority of the association. Um, in we, so we're uh, an authority that is, um, uh, we're, we're a service provider that is under the authority of the association. So I'll do a quick pause. Well, actually, I'll run through the whys and then I'll do a quick pause because I see there are a couple of questions that are, are, are coming in. So why do regulators do go through the trouble of saying, okay, in the mission of our public safety, um, we wanna make sure that we control the issuance and revocation of a digital authentication tool for in, that, that is linked to professional practice. Well, it's because forged documents are real. And uh, back a couple of years ago, that was the main motivation of, of uh, the Association of Engineers and Scientists of Manitoba. Um, there were, and, and you, can, you can click on it, you can view it. I'll have the hyperlink in the presentation. Uh, I'll share the presentation deck with uh, uh, Gemma and Mike uh, from uh, Engineers Geoscientists. But 
you can view it. So back a couple of years ago, there were cases where um, people were copying and pasting engineers a stamp and signature onto uh, plans and drawings that engineers have never seen. And a lot of times is, is contractors trying to get their building their, their uh, building permit issue. Uh, so there's, there were a lot of examples in Southern Ontario as well, where you can see here an email sent to chief building official, city of Brantford. It has uh, in that email, it was copying and pasting of the engineer's signature and seal to say, yeah, everything's good. We're, we're ready to build. Obviously the engineer never saw those designs. Um, and it even led to a, a tra tragedy in the shopping mall in Southern Ontario as well. Um, again, there's a, other cases where you have illegal practice. So uh, in one case, you have a professional engineer that had his license revoked. The engineer surrendered their rubber stamp, but they had made a copy or a JPEG image of their stamp and they were still doing illegal practice. And there were actually a building official who called the bluff, called the association up and say, hey, I'm not sure that this guy is, is allowed to, uh, to practice anymore. And it turns out he wasn't. So that's one main reason public safety is a core mission of the association. Uh, and uh, the uh, a, a digital signature certificate issued and managed by the association is a key ingredient for public safety. So the professional digital signature, what does it do? Well, it confirms the signer's identity. So it meets the first requirement of the Electronic Commerce uh, and Information Act of Manitoba it reliably, very reliably confirms the signer's identity because we do face-to-face -face ID vetting before issuing. It protects the data integrity of the electronic document. It didn't go into details about that, but asymmetric key encryption, that's one of the key features uh, that it does. It confirms that the person is a registrant in good standing of his, her professional association, in this case, Engineer Joe Scientist Manitoba, the issuance and revocation is under the control of the professional association. In other words, Engineers Geoscientist Manitoba does not have to ask Nateris permission to revoke someone's signature. Uh, they have this access to secure, the registrars have access to secure console. They can pull the plug on an engineer's digital certificate as soon as that person is, is suspended or barred. The use of the signature is under the control of the registrant, just for like for my bank card. My bank card is under the control of myself. However, if my bank suspect foul play or um, uh, that, that someone might have stole my credential and are starting to go on a shopping spree, they can pull the plug on my, on my card and deactivate it. So the same applies for the uh, engineer's geoscientist digital signature. It's easily and freely verifiable by the public. So the relying parties, City of Winnipeg, Ministry of Transportation, the ones who you are submitting your documents to, they don't have to purchase any third party software to validate the signature. And it supports the association's mission of public safety. Um, before, actually it's building officials here, but it's for public. Before we move on, I will, uh, I see that there's a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, Mike, if, if you, if maybe we can give a crack at, at answering a couple of those. Sure, Charles. Uh, the first question that we have posted here in the chat is from Christopher. The question is, once a document is authenticated by a member in good standing, but then ends their membership and e-authentication account, how is the document then verified if no account exists? And I give an example here, somebody retires or ends their membership to move to another province. Yeah, that is a very, very good question. And this is the reason why you want to embed the proof in the record. So at the time of signing, so if let's say uh, you retire, so you digitally sign your last project before retiring. Uh, and uh, so as of today, you are a member full-fledged in good standing, so your digital signature certificate will, will work. All that proof is embedded in the file. And after you retire and you revoke your signature, the signature will still show up as valid because at the time of signature, again, your certificate and password worked. Um, so there's long-term validity. This is pretty technical, but it'll say that signature is, is, was valid at the time of signing. Um, so that's the way we do it. 
It's the same Charles, way just as to, the, yeah. yeah. So if I understand correctly, then Notarius' server maintains that information. And so when a recipient receives the document after the person has retired, that checking goes to Notarius' server, which says, oh, yes, at the time this was signed, they were a valid member. Is that correct? That is kind of sort of correct, but it, it, you don't even need to access or, or this is where the, it's important. Even if we were to go out of business, those documents would remain valid because the okay. proof at the time of signing is embedded in the record that was digitally signed. Um, but obviously we keep all the key history as well. Uh, keep in mind that we are, so we're owned by the Board of Notaries of Quebec who are using this for the Quebec land title registration. So the chances of us going out of business is, is pretty slim because it is required for the Quebec land title registry and the Alberta land title registry as well. Um, but if we were to go out of business, we have obligations to keep those system up and running, I think for a period of at least two decades or something like that. Mm. Uh, but the proof of authenticity is in the file itself. You wouldn't need to access our system. Yep. Great, thanks. Uh, next question here is from Mark. Uh, Mark asks, I've noticed that the file size becomes huge after digitally signing. 16 megabytes became 44 megabytes after signing for a 20 drawing, uh, 20 sheet drawing package. So what strategies can I take to keep the size reasonable? Um, so the digital signature itself would probably typically add 16K of data to our file. What I'm suspecting is that the image of your seal uh, and signature, for example, that might be the heavy piece of your signature. So it's actually nothing to do with the digital signature. It probably has to do, so if you're applying the image of your uh, stamp and signature, you might want to take a look at the size of, of that image. And you might want to try and find a way to make it a, a lighter PNG file. Um, that's what I'm suspecting that's happening because or you're signing 16 times over the same file. But even so, if I were to be doing that, typically speaking, it's a couple of kilobytes of data that, that we're adding. It's probably linked to the image. Right. I wonder if there's also something happening here in the transition, if they're talking about say AutoCAD files as they get converted to PDF, is there something there that makes it larger? Typically speaking, it's the other way around. A PDF mm -hmm. file is a flat file. There's a lot less metadata. And typically speaking, um, the, the file size between the CAD drawing and the PDF would, would be reduced. Um, I would be curious to see if, if that person is using our Consigno desktop tool, maybe converting it into a PDFA compliant that might make the file a bit lighter and we'll be demoing that in just a couple of moments. Great, thank you. Uh, yeah. Next question is, is from Christopher again. How is a user of an e-authentication account protected in the event the system is cracked? For example, credit cards used to be based on signatures and if you refute a charge, the bank must prove it's you. Now they switched to chip and pin and the user agreements have changed to state all chip and pin charges are valid and you are responsible unless you can prove it's not you. How are we protected? It's a very good question. So again, technology is not trust. It's, uh, it's, it's the way technology is managed. Uh, and this is why we are constantly uh, updating uh, encryption um, uh, um, algorithms. Uh, typically speaking with the most powerful computers, it would take you a couple of years to crack one person's digital signature certificate on, on the current security algorithms that we're using. This is why as part of our processes, we automatically reissue you a new pair of signature keys every two years. So anyone that would have A, the motivation and B, the financial means of renting the most powerful computer <laughs> 360 uh, days, uh, 24 hours, to try and crack your, your, your own digital signature, well, that would probably fail because by the time they would be able to crack it, uh, you would have a new key pair and they would have to start over. Uh, so this is all making sure that we're updated with regards to encryption algorithms. 
um, and all the ID vetting processes. Obviously, we're we're investing a lot of money in physical security and logical security. We're uh, constantly uh, doing some what we call we hire ethical hackers to try to hack in, uh, into our systems and try to crack it. Um, so these are all the efforts that we're doing. Again, keep in mind that uh, to that person's point, if, if we were ever breached uh, and someone would have access to the root certificate, that is the mother of all certificates, chances are it happened once in Belgium and that company went bankrupt in two weeks. Uh, it's, it's not something that we can allow and we're doing everything uh, that we can to, to avoid that. Um, I, I don't foresee how someone could do it, but then again, uh, the CIA got hit. So, but that's a very good question, and we do uh, we, we make sure that we check all the boxes uh, to avoid that. And Charles, is there something that the user can do to help protect themselves against being hacked? You know, there's sort of conversations that I've seen in the past about making sure that where you keep your key, your personal key, needs to be. Uh, protected. So keep it on a machine that you have in your in your possession and that That's isn't going to go. Yeah. In. That, that is actually a very good point. There is one way that you could be vulnerable is what we call a, a, a man in the middle type of attack, which is I have access to your computer. I now see your encrypted file or your bank card that has that chip on it that has the, the encrypted data. And I can actually uh, see you uh, input your password. So basically I could then steal away um, that credential and I now have access because I was able to spy on your computer. You, there's different mechanism that you can add some extra security uh, layer. You could have your digital signature certificate on a USB token. It could be an encrypted USB token as well, a password protected token. These are extra steps. Um, keep in mind that uh, Hackers will try to uh, align effort and payback. So what is the payback for me to steal someone's engineering certificate? What, what's the financial gains or benefits here to say I'm able to sign a plan and a drawing on behalf of Mike uh, Gregoire? Chances are that they're probably, they're probably interested in something else in your computer, which is probably related to your personal banking. And I, I imagine there's, there's probably value in us dis discussing the comparisons, right? So what are the alternatives to the notarious digital signature? Well, self-signing, that's a lot easier for somebody to uh, fake or, 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 or make it look like you've signed it when you haven't. Um, mm -hmm. Even as we said, you know, the, the digital, the manual signature and, a, and an image of it, that's extremely easy to, to spoof. So uh, as far as we know, this is the most robust system for, for issuing digital documents. It is, it, it is, it is for me, the, uh, the I, I need to have access to your digital signature certificate and we'll show that in a couple of seconds. And I need to know the password to use it. And then I need to align what are the motivations for me in doing that as well. Uh, again, chances are if I'm hacking your personal computer, it's probably to have access to uh, personal information to forge an identity, a credit card, uh, driver's license, uh, false identity. I'm probably not, it's like how, what's the level of trouble in the paper world is, is how motivated are people to come into your office and steal your rubber stamp? Uh, yeah. So that's, that's okay. the key. Yep. Next question we have, and it's the last that has been posted so far. Uh, is from Kevin. Kevin asks, how would a digital signature work if the client needs to sign the cover page of the plans? Uh, you, you can work in collaboration. And, well, that would depend on what signature software that your customer has, or are they just copying and pasting the image of their signature on it? If your customer has access to a digital signature, there's no limits on the amount of signatures that can be applied to a single file. Uh, we've seen cases where you'll, you'll have electrical engineer, mechanical engineer, structural engineer, uh, maybe an architect, they can all sign the same record. There's no limitations as to the amount of signers that you can have. Uh, that is true of digital signatures. Obviously, if they're using something else, uh, then it might be a question of workflow. 
they might want to have to sign in their own system, sending you the file, and then you digitally sign it to make sure that uh, you have the latest and greatest version. Or it could be the other way around, depending on what they're using. You'll see what what doc what the modifications were applied to the documents after you signed it. Yeah, thanks, Charles. And I I'll just put in a pitch here that. Uh, Notarius support has been very helpful for our members in the past. So if you have a specific use case, uh, reach out to Notarius and they can help you figure out how to, how to achieve this. There's a lot, that's a good point, uh, Mike. There's, uh, if you take a look on YouTube, the Notarius channel, we've just released a, a set of 21 uh, short videos on our Consigno desktop the signature tool. This is what I'll be demoing in, in, in just a moment. Um, so that people have actually a, a visual on how it works. Great. Perfect. Uh, so let's move on to the demo. Well, free and easy validation tool for the public. Uh, anyone that has Adobe Reader or Standard or Pro, they just need to configure it properly. Uh, we've got the link here uh, to be able to know where to look. What's the root CA, Notarius? Where is it? What's the URL address to validate the signature? For your customers or members of the public to whom you are submitting multiple documents and they want to be able to validate in bulk, they can go on our website and download Consigno Desktop. It's free. They should just make sure that their IT is good with that uh, and, and you'll be able to uh, validate in bulk. There's another one that's really, really easy. I'll show it to you in a couple of minutes. It's verifio.com. It's a free web page. You just upload the documents and it'll tell you if it's been digitally signed and tampered and so on and so forth. Um, so I'll just jump into a quick demo. So I'll step out of my presentation at this point. Um, I hope everyone still sees my screen. Uh, I'm not an engineer, not a, a geoscientist. I'm an employee at Notarius. So I'm, I'm, let's pretend that uh, the Word document here, it could be a CAD drawing, it could be a BIM file, it could be an Excel spreadsheet. In this case, it's a Word document and a, it's a draft contract agreement, could be an engineering report. Let's do that. So um, I'm generating an engineering report. Uh, I can print that, sorry for the French OS here, folks, uh, but this is print. I'm gonna print it to PDF. I'm gonna name that, I'll be original. And name it I'll name it demo engineering uh, geoscientist Manitoba. Let's do that. The other software that we have with your digital signature certificate is an application that's called Consigno Desktop. Remember I said we were a strong advocate of the PDFA file format and for that person earlier on, that had issue with file size, maybe that could help. Uh, Consigno Desktop has three main windows. Number one is the uh, uh, where I can sort through my files and folders, my templates, and the larger one here is what we call the viewer. So the viewer is when I open the file up, it's like an, an Adobe Reader, right? It, it's, it's viewing the file. It's in the engineering report. I can zoom in, zoom out. If it were a multi-page report, I could uh, move around in the document uh, by changing uh, pages or going to the end. Um, but right off the bat, it says it does not claim any PDFA standard. You want to convert to PDFA? Yes. There's three level, version one, two, three. The higher up you are, the more restrictive it is, the more uh, the, the, it's gonna be the latest and greatest PDFA standard version. Um, I'm just gonna do that. <clears throat> so instead of printing the paper or plotting the paper and then taking my roles, stamping, signing, dating, I replaced the paper with a PDF file. And then I can create a signature zone. I can manually create one, or I can use a custom format. Uh, again, you can custom all of that. I can, I can have a small zone, big zone, initial zone, signature zone. Let's take the uh, small one, which is gonna be a square one. And at that point, I could, I could create multiple signature zones. So for the person that said, well, if, if uh, another colleague needs to sign, I could name it. So I could say, okay, this is gonna be 
mic. Um, so I can, we got bored after 50 co-signers on a single document. So it just goes to, to say there's no limits on to the amount of signers that, that can sign a document. Once I've created that, by the way, can sign a desktop can be downloaded by your office staff. So they can do all that prep work for you. So they can take the CAD drawing, convert it to PDFA, prepare your signature zone for you. And at which point you would be ready to review and sign. That will bring me to the signature wizard. And then I can use whatever image I want. I can, so the, uh, let's take, this is a British Columbia example one, but I can uh, use this one here. Uh, I can display uh, the date. So you are required to sign it. You can change in the aspect preferences, the font of the date. It could be year, month, day, month, day, year. You can do whatever you want. You can change the font size, color. You can display a reason. Um, you've got some pre, I ver confirm verified, but I can have a custom reason here to say, don't build with this because it's preliminary, for example. And it will show up on, this, on the appearance as well. And once I'm ready to um, sign, if I can just go down here, actually, need to. sign, then I'm going to the bank machine. This is my digital signature certificate. That's the encrypted file that has all my, my information in. I need the right password to use it. That would be my PIN number. I'm seeing we're rapidly rolling, getting to the hour, so I'm gonna go try to go fast here. Uh, so now the document is digitally signed. Um, now I've got a valid signature here. Before, I didn't. Let's take a look at how that looks in Adobe Reader, for example. Uh, so let's go ahead and open that file up. That is the one I just did. So it is a PDFA. I could enable editing if I'd remove the PDFA and do some changes to it. Again, we would track the change. I'll give you the example. So now it's digitally signed. So if, if, would have, if I would have copied and pasted the image, hovering over the image, it points towards a valid signature. And this is what you want to look for. The only person that could have applied the signature into the, the person's uh, question before, it's at the moment of signing, the signature was valid. My certificate is valid again. I, I'm going to be reissued uh, a new brand new key pair just in case someone is trying to hack my key pair for now and trying to brute force it. Uh, we will reissue some new key pairs with the latest and greatest encryption algorithm in the detail, the revocation. These are all the information that you can have. If I were a member of Engineer Geoscientist, you would have in the organization name. ENG, uh, the association, you would have the member number, you would have the professional title designation. I'm obviously not a member, uh, so I don't have that information. <clears throat> Let's compare that to a document that was not digitally signed, only an image. See the signature tab here is missing. If I hover over the image, nothing's happening. There's no digital signature certificate attached to that file. Um, it's going to very few, very rapidly. I could use a very few uh, website. And let's do the, um, where is it? So I, I could also go there, uploading it, and it'll tell me everything that I need to know. And if the document had been tampered, it will tell me, well, there's been some unsigned changes that were made. And in Adobe Reader, I could track the changes. Um, to, to do so. We're already at the top of the hour. So folks, if, if uh, Mike, I don't know, Mike if, and, and Gemma, if we have a hard stop at this point, if not, I can go on for a couple of minutes. We don't have a hard stop. So if, if you want to continue and those who can stay on, that'd be great. Perfect. Uh, 
little advanced features for you here, uh, everyone, that's, that are pretty cool is I've got a set of drawings here. Uh, it's the same drawing, but it's drawing number one, two, three, four, five, six. So basically what I can do is I can select them all. I can convert them all in bulk into PDFA formats. So basically I'm making those standard PDFs. I'm, I'm making them PDFA 3B compliant. And then I'll be able to apply a template to all of them. I can say, apply a template. Basically a template is a predefined signature zone. So let's go back to that first drawing here. Typically speaking, that's how your documents look like right? You have your corporate header, you've got the drawings, you've got the notes, and then you've got the area where you typically affix the image of your stamp, signature, date, and so on and so forth. So what I can, I, I can, you can create some templates, you can apply a template to all those files. And that was pretty quick. So now all of these documents they have a signature zones, the size I wanted on all documents. And I can then, my session should still be open. So it's not gonna ask me for my passwords, like online banking. If you're active for a couple of minutes, uh, your session remains active. So I can go ahead and sign in bulk. I can choose the image again, apply the reason. And if I click sign, it's gonna go ahead and apply the images where I wanted to, the dates, the reason, and so on and so forth. And now they're all digitally signed. And I can say, hey, before sending it to my customers, I wanna make sure that they are signed. So let's reveal the signed documents. Yep, they all have a green check mark and I can email it directly from Consigno Desktop if I'd want to. So these are a bit of advanced features uh, for you. Um, let's take another example here, because a lot of times, let's say you're submitting to a building official um, and the building official says, well, I need to do my work and I need to do some editing. Um, and that's exactly what I'm gonna do here. I'm gonna, uh, it could be a, a zone text, it could be a stamp for the building permit, or it could be the building official say, I reviewed and approved for building permit, for example. Now let's save this. And let's close it and see what happens. So now I've got a digitally signed document by the engineer or geoscientist. It's been submitted. The municipality has made some changes to it. And Charles has promised me that the documents are tamper proof. Well, they are, but we still need to work, right? And I need to allow maybe the building official or someone to do a review on it. Um, so sign, all signatures are valid. There's some unsigned changes and I can actually know what has been changed. So there, hey, there's been annotation created on page one. This I reviewed and approved for building permit was added. Um, and if someone says, well, you're responsible for that, I can say, no, professionally speaking, I'm responsible for the sign version. So when I say that the proof is in the record, that's what I meant. Uh, it's in the PDF file. So you don't need to have access to our system and so on and so forth. The proof is in the PDF itself. Um, so these are, are, are a bit of, there's other, a lot more features in the Consigno desktop that, that are fun to have. Again, I, I invite you to go to YouTube or in a terrace channel, you'll see a lot of them. One of them is really cool is the ability to, to attach original file formats into a digitally signed PDF. So what you could create is a header, a PDF header. And then I can, in the same way that you can attach files to an email, 
you can attach BIM files, CAD drawings, Word document, Excel spreadsheet in that PDF. And then you can digitally sign the PDF and all the attachments that are included. On the receiving end, I'm the customer. If I want to have access to the, uh, to, uh, the original work file, which was the, the CAD drawing, I can extract it from the digitally signed PDF and play with it. You're not responsible because it's no longer into that digitally uh, signed document. That's the way Alberta transportation works. If you want to Google something pretty neat, you can Google uh, Alberta transportation bolt in 108. They have what they call in every project, the final details. And in the final details, what they need is all the original file format, the uh, uh, CAD drawings, the Excel spreadsheet that was used for the calculation. So the engineers will attach that into a digitally signed PDF and submit that. And Alberta Transportation is able to validate that the document was signed off by an engineer and then be able to extract those file format for their own use. Um, so we're six minutes past. I'm seeing a couple of questions in the chat. I might, yeah. so maybe we can take a crack at those as well. For sure. I, I do see people are dropping off. I want to thank everybody for joining. If you have to leave, uh, thank you for, for participating. And you can catch the recording once uh, that link is set out. Uh, question here from Christopher. It's more of a request. Can you show what happens to the signature if someone enables editing and then changes the document that's been signed? That, yep, that we just did that uh, when we when we had the uh, building official example uh, with this file here, right? So I did some changes to it. Uh, I played the role of the building official. I applied this after the document was changed. And I can, so I'll have a message, the document signed, the uh, signature is valid. In other words, my bank card and my PIN number work when I signed a document and I can track what changes has been applied to the document since I signed it. And for my professional responsibility, well, my professional responsibility is limited to the version I signed, which is right click, view sign version. And you can see here, there's no, there's not the annotation anymore. Right. That and that would be, that would be similar to if somebody actually changes, like let's say they added text and they said yep. engineering report, you know, if Any that text change. has changed. Yeah. Yep. Any change. If I were to add my stamp, for example, just an image, it would be considered a change, a change because I'm probably going to create a, a text box and, and, and apply data to, to the document. So, in a nutshell, the way digital signature works under the hood, right, is if you have a five meg file, what you're doing is you're applying a, a mathematical algorithm to that file and you're creating what we call a checksum, which is a mathematical summary. So I'm taking the binary code of the file, which is a series of random zeros and ones, I'm applying a mathematical function to it that generates a very, very short mathematical checksum. And that is what I encrypt with my digital certificate. So I'm not encrypting the file, I'm basically encrypted the fingerprint of that file. So that's why everyone has access to the file, the file is unencrypted. But if you modify that file and you rerun that mathematical function against the document, the, the, the result, the mathematical checksum will be different because the document has changed. So that, in, in a nutshell, that's the way it works. Right, and any recipient can see what did the document look like at the time it was signed? Depending on the PDF viewer that you're using. Remember when we go online with Microsoft Edge, for example, Microsoft Edge has its own PDF reader it is a really, really, really basic PDF reader. It probably won't even tell you that the document has been digitally signed. So popular PDF readers, Consigno Desktop is a popular one. It's used by almost 50%, over 50% of our subscribers. Adobe is a very popular one that has the capability of validating. Bluebeam, very popular as well. Those are the main ones. Uh, Based on our annual survey, 94% of the folks will either use Adobe, Bluebeam, or Consigno as their preferred reader. They all have the features to validate a signature. Right, great. Yeah. Uh, another question from Lisa. 
when would click the certify box when signing a document? How is this different from just signing the document? That is, that is a painful <laughs> thing to do. Uh, if you are completely adverse to anyone doing whatever modification to your file, you would certify the document. That effectively freezes any document tampering anyone can do with it, including adding an additional signature. So let's say that in this example here, both signature boxes were signed and the documents is certified, I could not add another signature box. So, so certifying a document is if you wanna make absolutely 100% sure that no one can do anything with, with your documents. Uh, commenting, you. amending, yeah. Yep. And then the last one here is, uh, can you show us what happens when someone tries to copy the digital seal via a screenshot and uses that copy to sign a different document? Yep, that's a, that's a good question. So we can do it right away. But what you'll see is that this piece of information here will not carry over to the other document. Because the only way that I can embed that piece of information is, oh, I'll show you the path to it uh, right here. Where is it? That's my encrypted digital signature certificate. And if I click on it, it'll challenge me to the password. So that's my bank card. Again, to someone else earlier on had the question of, can I be more secure? Yeah, I could store that onto a USB token. to Make sure that uh, uh, only someone having access to the USB token would actually have access to the file. Rather than uh, if my computer is hacked, well, they have the file, they don't have the password, but if they have some spyware, they might catch my password. But then again, what you need to understand, well, what, what benefits uh, as a hacker am I getting in obtaining an engineering geoscientist digital signature certificate? But, um, so let's do it. Uh, let's actually do that. Uh, let's do, um, Just gonna minimize this here. Uh, view. Let's uh, try to zoom out here. Actually, basically, what I'm gonna do right is uh, control print screen. Um, let's go into paint and then what I'm gonna do here is. Select this. And then I'm gonna select all, copy, and then I'm gonna go back to Word. I'm gonna paste it. I can move it around obviously wherever I want. And then I'm gonna create a brand new PDF with that. And I'm going to call it fake. So let's look at what happens. So remember that signature tab here that has all the information on the digital signature certificate. When we go into the fake one, yeah, it has an image, but where's the signature? Where's the digital certificate? So this is where as an engineer, I can, if I'm using the engineer's geoscientist uh, digital signature certificate, I can reverse the burden of proof saying, yeah, that document has an image. Anyone could have copied and pasted. That document does not have my digital signature certificate embedded into it. So I think this also hammers home this idea that the image is not the signature when we're talking about digital signatures, right? That image is essentially a representation for people to sort of be comfortable with. But you could sign, you can digitally sign a document and effectively it'd be blank in the signature section visually. Is that correct? That is absolutely 100% correct. Let's do that uh, here. Let's erase. 
and let's uh, print PDF. And let's say invisible signature. To your point, uh, Michael, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to go into uh, consign on desktop, just going to refresh here. So that's not going to take the time to convert it to, to PDFA for this example, but you'll see, I can sign the document. It's going to ask me, do you want to create a signature zone? Uh, no, I, I don't need to have an image. So it doesn't ask me what signature appearance I want here because there's no signature box to apply an image. So again, bank card, password. Now, to your point, Michael, if we go back into Adobe, we would have the same sort of visual in Bluebeam, for example, and the invisible signature. There's obviously no image here, but hey, I've got a message here and I've got that tab that tells me, yep, yeah, that document bears the cert Charles's certificate with all the information. So who's the issuer, revocation, trust, summary, um, this is, so oh, to your point, uh, Michael. Yep. Yeah, great. And then we've got uh, another add-on question. Again, thanks to everyone who's sticking around. We're, we've dropped off about half the participants so far. Uh, Christopher says, so copy, paste, to seal as possible. And that does not prevent someone from printing and submitting a copy to someone else as an original copy. And I'll, I'll handle that question. You know, this is, a, this is something that, um, that has been asked by uh, authorities having jurisdictions. So example, for example, City of Winnipeg, their planning and property uh, department, uh, they've asked this question before. If you receive a paper document, it's only an original if there's wet ink on that piece of paper. And that means that somebody has signed it physically with a pen after it's been printed. So yes, we can always create copies of things, but a copy is a copy. And we encourage uh, recipients, in particular author um, authorities having jurisdiction, to ask for originals. And that way they can have a, uh, that higher level of assurance that the document has been submitted and authenticated by the engineer whose name is on the document. That is a very good point. Uh, Mike, and that, that was, I was the, the, the reason I was referring earlier on to a handwritten signature as being something that is extremely unique to a person, almost impossible to imitate as well. So if you're, if you're digitally signing your original records, then your records are electronic. The originals are, if you're printing those off, it's like making a photocopy of the handwritten uh, hand signed document. You might want to apply to reapply your initials or re-sign the whole sets of drawings just to make sure that it captures your uh, unique uh, handwritten signature. Yeah. And that's why our authentication guideline talks about if you are printing off a digitally signed document, there should be a note on there that indicates that it was signed digitally and that whoever's viewing the copy in the printed form should look to uh, the original form to ensure that it, it matches the uh, matches the content. Very good point. And we're seeing that with uh, a, a lot of uh, engineering consulting firms where here in the notes, that's where there would be a mention that happens, say all the documents of ABC Engineering Inc. are original. Any printouts of those are copy or reproduction of an electronic original. So Great. People have embedded that into their, their practice. Yep. And somebody has slipped in another question here. Is this consigno desktop free? It's part of uh, your uh, digital signature annual subscription fee. There's no limitation on the amount of office staff that can have access to it. So in some way it is free. There's, we don't restrict the download and installation uh, of, of this software. So that's why when you have an engineering professional practice, a lot of times you'll have three engineers and six drawing folks, right? Technical folks that are doing the technical drawings. They can have access to the consignable desktop. They can convert the CAD drawings into PDF. They can make the PDF PDFA compliant. 
They can prepare the signature zone for you. And you can go on doing exactly what you were doing before, which is reviewing the documents, digitally authenticating them. Um, and so you don't have to do all that prep work uh, that you weren't doing uh, in the paper world as well. So. Great. Um, just as a follow-up for my own end, and so Verify, though, is that one free? It's a web page, actually. So ah, it, it is free. Uh, so it's really, you go to... The, the, the drawback with Verifio and Adobe is that it's one document at a time, mm. right? Uh, so if you say, well, I want to, uh, which one of these is digitally signed? And I don't want to have to open them one by one. So I can right click on those and I can reveal the signed documents. So there's, a, you need to be aware of the different messages. So the green with the number one, it means it's checked off. It's all good. Digitally signed by one person. You could have number two, three, four, five. So it's digitally signed by five people. Uh, this one here has a little exclamation point. So if I actually dig into it, this is one that will tell me the document is digitally signed. There's been some changes done to it. Um, and this is where you, you can see that there's some changes done to it. In Adobe Reader, you'll be able to know exactly what has been changed. And this, the fake one, and this one here, there's no signature at all on those. So Great. for convenience, so very few is a web page. You upload it. It tells you if everything's good but it's one document at a time. If you want to do right. bulk validation, uh, you could propose to your customer that they have consigno desktop, they can download it for free and they'll be. So we are also trying to work with, for example, the Manitoba Building Official Association just to train them on how to validate an engineer at digital signature, for example, and how they, they can, in fact, you know, make changes and the changes will, will, will be tracked. Great. And then possibly the last question for today, uh, Christopher asks, is each e-authentication unique to the association of registration or can notarious membership have multiple province memberships in one? Actually, that's a very good question. So let's do that, uh, notarious.com. I think we have you set up under, I think it's still under a peg M, but we would have to change yeah. that. So for example, here, I can go here and if I click subscribe, right, I'll be able to subscribe as a, a PGO, P engine, PGO, GOL. G, uh, so these are different, but the question was, I am a registered member in uh, Manitoba, but I am also registered in, uh, in PEO, for example. So if I'm registered in PEO, you won't, if you already have a digital signature with Engineers Geoscientists Manitoba, you won't have to pay the sign up fee to get a PEO digital signature certificate. That's one thing. And instead of paying the full fee for the annual subscription and support and software updates, the annual subscription for your second will be, is only $75. Yeah, and that, that makes sense, right? We need a different certificate for each province because our membership changes province to province, not necessarily as a group. So Same somebody, logic as with yeah. the rubber step, right? Yeah. You don't have yeah. the same member number. It's not the same image. Uh, so, yeah, but we, we, we don't. So because we don't have to revet your ID every time, we've done it once with your, we will ask you to you to identify yourself with your diff, a big, uh, with the uh, engineers, geoscientists, uh, Manitoba digital credential. So we know we've met before, we know who you are and the annual subscription won't be the full charge. It's just to cover the minimal license fees that we have to fork out to the people. Great. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we will end it there. Uh, we are well past the uh, initial scheduled time. So I wanna thank everybody who has stuck around uh, uh, until the end here. Um, Thank you, Charles, so much for that presentation. I think it was very helpful. I think the amount of questions really showed the interest level. 
Um, and I think it's probably been very helpful to our members who don't already have a digital signature and maybe even some of those who already do have a signature. Yeah, for those who do have, send us an email. We do have advanced sessions as well, um, advanced training sessions on advanced features. So if you, do, if, you, if you want that, send us. So my email address is charles.trombley at uh, natarius.com. Um, so I had that actually in the last slide. I'm glad uh, to have you all today. It was great. Lots of great questions. Uh, keep in touch with us. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you.